Welcome to my studio here in downtown Carmel. Thank you for joining me. My name is John Castagnero, and I will be reading from my book, The Teachings of Yama, The Conversation with Death. And we are on chapter eight, and we'll also read chapter nine since they're very short chapters. So the first chapter, Between Extremes, Wanting the Truth. I again thanked my teacher and asked for more virtues to be cultivated. We stood now in a long hall with doors to the left and right. Where are we? What's behind the doors? I asked. Pick one. I chose the first door on the right. Inside was a monk. He held in his hand a knotted rope in which he struck himself, his eyes sunken from lack of food and sleep. Please, sir, I asked, I said to him. Why do you whip yourself? I am a great sinner, and the temptation of the flesh is terrible. Only by subduing the senses and denying pleasure to the body can one reach heaven. Fast, sleep not, look upon no woman, and storm the gates of heaven. Silently I closed the door, leaving him thumping his head upon the floor. Try another door, Yoma said. On the left side this time. I did. I saw a woman wearing a silken dress, richly adorned with jewelry and a plush room. She lounged on pillows, fed and fanned by male servants. Come in, she said to me in a languorous voice. Eat. She pointed to the vast array of savory dishes in front of her. She leaned forward obviously not shy about her revelations. Eat, and then I closed the door. Yama smiled, that teacher smiled. Down the right side I opened a multitude of doors. One had a naked man standing on one leg with a long needle through his cheek. Another had a woman walking around a statue of some god, only stopping to sleep a moment or two, or stopping to eat a mouthful, mouthful of food. Another had a group of men with scriptures in their laps, all silently reading throughout the day. Another had a yogini with the sun overhead, sitting in a ring of fires. Countless doors on the right stretched down the endless hall. On the left side, behind one door, was a couple in sexual embrace, doing complicated rituals and positions throughout the day. Another had a group of people eating magic mushrooms, and staring into space and laughing at their visions. Behind another door was a man of great physical stature, lifting weights in a gym, while behind another door a woman twisted herself into all kinds of bodily knots. And on and on the doors on the left contained, continued. After a while I stopped opening doors. What did you see? my guide asked. I beheld people engaged quite seriously quite intently in some activity or another. Some, the ones on the right perhaps, seemed to be engaged in activities that were more traditionally spiritual, less oriented on the body. Indeed, he almost said, all those you beheld were extremely engaged in an activity. However, neither side brings one closer to the awareness that is beyond my reach for they all are focused on their particular activity. Remember, all activity is in the realm of life and death. If one becomes too one-pointed in an activity, there is great danger of attachment to the activity in identifying oneself as the action. For example, those practicing asceticism may call themselves ascetics. That becomes their definition. When the ever-flowing life wants them to be evolving into other activities, they will not be able to, because such activities go against their definition of being an ascetic. Which is what you were saying about being a vegetarian, I interjected. Being a vegetarian is one of those traps, yes? Yes. And instead of just being in the life flow, they become rigid, and I have to cut them down. That is why moderation is best. Then one can walk down the hallway and not get stuck in any room. <clears throat> moderation in all things, I inquired. 
Yes, in outward activity. Yes, not in terms of inner movement. It takes constant vigilance of the mind in directing it to the awareness to reside in that which you always are. The inward fervor needs to be greater than any of those persons in the hall with their pursuits. I think I understand. Although, can you demonstrate how intense one must be inwardly? With a wide grin on his face, Yama walked behind me. Suddenly I felt one of his hands close my nose and the other close my mouth. Frantically, I struggled to remove his hands and to gain a breath. I struck out with my fists. I tried to bite, thinking only of getting a breath. I wanted only to breathe once more. I wanted only that. And to gain that one breath, I would offer anything in the world. Nothing in all the world could be more valuable. Then the hands were gone from my face, and air rushed in to fill the void in my lungs. I gasped. When I had my fill of air, I accusingly asked Yama if he wanted to kill me. Well, after all, I am death, he smiled. No, I'm just answering your question. You must want God or the self as much as that air. You must have the realization that only that gives you life. All else, all activities are nothing compared to that. Without that, you can do nothing. Down on my knees, I fell, tears flowing in streams. Oh, Yama, I touch your holy feet for that lesson. How easy is it to forget that God is even more precious than air. And as air is all pervasive, it is easily forgotten, easily taken for granted. As so is all that is. Oh, blessed are the moments when one breathes in God with remembrance and gratitude. Yes, said Yama, and in such times one can even feel God breathing in you. Chapter 9 Right Action The Maze of the Mind Dear Teacher, you brought me into that hall where individuals were engaged in activities and showed me that they do not lead one from your grasp. Is there any activity that aids in developing character? Of course, but engaging in activity, no matter what the action, one needs to give up the idea that I am doing it. Selfless service is best, which entails not dwelling on what is to be gained, as well as doing one's best. Does this work need to be philanthropic? Like feeding the poor? Certainly, feeding the poor and such other kind, caring work is good to do. It will help open one's heart and allow it to expand beyond the limited needs of oneself into the greater needs of others. However, let me show you something. We stood in a balcony of a palace looking down upon a great garden. In the middle of the garden was a maze of hedgerows hedgerows. Very complicated was the design, with twists and turns and lots of dead ends. In the center was a circle, and in that circle, written in the bloom of flowers, was the word Buddhahood. Standing on high, I could see various individuals wandering lost in the maze in their search for the center. I shook my head in dismay at their plight, for the maze seemed impossible. Is it possible to reach the center, I asked? Keep watching. Then I noticed a man in simple work clothes carrying a few garden tools. He walked with calm, steady steps upon a narrow, well-worn path, totally unseen by the other frantic seekers, that led from the periphery straight to the center. Occasionally he would stoop to go through a small opening in one of the hedges. What is that path? I asked. Oh, that? It is simply the path the gardener takes every day to do his work in tending the flowers. You mean gardening is the direct path to Buddhahood? I asked incredulously. Uh, no wonder I work so hard as death, said Yama, shaking his head. 
the way you humans take things so literally. The next thing you know, you will be starting a new religion where everyone must be gardeners and wear garden hose around their necks. The gardener does his duty tending to his flowers daily. Unlike the others in the maze, he thinks not about reaching some enlightened state of some far-off moment, nor does he think about where he has been. He is simple. He does what needs to be done, without complaint, without thinking. He tends to the flowers and does not think about home. He goes home after his duties and does not dwell on the flowers. The maze is nothing but the mind that constantly creates an amazing world to fascinate and hypnotize, creating dead ends and winding pathways. Look closer at the maze. I did. From a trick I learned as a child, I tried to follow a pathway from the center to the beginning of the periphery. Immediately I saw the reality that those seekers found themselves in. Hey, wait a minute. There is no way to reach the center by the maze. Each path on the periphery only leads to dead ends or to other paths that lead to the same. It's hopeless. Such is the mind. And that concludes chapter 9. I hope you liked it. hope you got something out of it. If you did, press that like button. Um, subscribe. I have lots of teachings, readings, art. Uh, I would love to have you subscribe. And please leave a comment. I would love to hear your thoughts. Well, have a great day. And I hope to see you again. Shanti.